Oh man, it's time for another episode of No Label Live, the show all about labels and how they can be your biggest adversity or your biggest advantage. The choice is yours. Each week, we bring on inspiring guests to share their story about how labels have impacted their life and the work that they do. So let's strap in and join this conversation. Guys, what's going on? It's Nathan, and man, we're just having a great conversation. Me and LaMondre, with everything that is going on in the world today, because I think that's one thing we can all agree with. We are living in some uh, unique times right now. And uh, you guys know that I've been talking a lot recently specifically on life with a disability um, and kind of my experience uh, with disability in the times that we face today but I think uh, Lamandre I just wanted to talk to you about your experience currently with everything going on in the world whether it is the pandemic, man, or whether it is all the social unrest that we've got going on in the world. So what's it been like the past three, four months for you? Uh, th- first of all, thank you for having me, Nathan. And uh, this is um, it's a great opportunity to kind of share some ideas and thoughts. The last three months uh, honestly have been surreal. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I remember, you know, growing up and, and seeing movies about, um, you know, about some kind of, uh, of, of airborne, uh, respiratory illness that, you know, that, 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 that attacks the world and, and how people deal with that. Uh, and lo and behold, in 2020, we're living that movie. Uh, and not only are we living that movie, but then you also look at, the uh, social issues that are going on, the uprisings that are happening throughout the world. It's not just a USA thing throughout the world. And you definitely understand when you say the winds of change are here, our lives have been absolutely turned upside down. Uh, and I don't think things will ever be the same again. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's like standing on the edge of that mountain and actually feeling the fall. You know, that that's what it's been like for me. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, I, that I've been struggling with as, as we've dealt with, uh, I'll go into the pandemic first, is the idea of understanding, like, a lot of people don't understand that how, if I get this thing, how it will affect me. Uh, Right. Because I'm in my 30s. So why can't I be walking around without a mask? Right. And I'm curious with your disability, could you give some people some insight on what that's like for you to think about a respiratory illness and what that can do for you? Right. Um, Hold on one second. Hold on yeah. one quick second. This is a part of my uh, this is a part of my regiment that's about to happen right now, actually. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you. This is real life. Yeah. This yeah. is real life. I'm, I'm good. The bank is good. That's really good though. It it has definitely um, it has definitely changed. It has definitely changed the. The, the, the way my life operates. When COVID-19 um, first really became an issue back in April, um, I knew that my life was going to change um, pretty drastically. In fact, I thought uh, because I have spinal muscular atrophy and my breathing is already somewhat compromised uh, because of that, I didn't know if I was going to a- be able to stay at home. I didn't know if I was going to, because I live by myself, and I didn't know if I was going to be able to maintain that lifestyle 
and actually we put things in place just in case I wasn't able to. My family, um, you know, put some things in place at their home um, in order for me to come there. And honestly, I was still uh, a bit concerned about it because here's the thing. I rely on attendant care services um, to, to, to function. And when I mean attendant care services, I have someone who comes in. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that, I have someone who comes in and they help me get dressed, they bathe me, they feed me, um, they get me set up at my workstation, um, they come in the middle of the day and help me with things like toileting and all of those things. In other words, everything that you need to do in order to just live, I have someone who comes in and helps me with. In fact, the person who just uh, gave me uh, that drink is one of the people who, who comes to help me out. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure if that was going to be able to be maintained. And fortunately, it was. But that also meant that we had to take other precautions. Um, so like all of my attendants, they wear masks. Um, we are constantly sanitizing hands. We're constantly doing, doing all the things we know to do, doing all the things that we know to do to be safe, doing all the things that we know to do um, to, to actually uh, protect not only myself, but also them uh, from contracting COVID-19. And, you know, it's for months, this is what we've had to do. For months, this is something that's been a reality um, in our world. Now, here's the other thing, though. Here's the other thing. With that, with that, the other thing is that no matter what you do, there's still that chance. If you notice my attendant that just left, she had on full-fledged PPEs. Mm -hmm. She had on a face shield, a mask, a head covering, and a gown. Well, the reason that is is because earlier this week, I was exposed to COVID-19. Um, one of my aides, um, who was asymptomatic, didn't know she had it, got tested, and found that she was uh, positive for COVID-19. And I got the call this morning saying that, that I had been exposed um, to this. And, you know, when you first hear, when you first hear that, of course, there was that jolt of, whoa, really? Mm -hmm. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, we've done everything that we could do to, to, to protect themselves. Now, keep in mind, I'm quarantining because I was around someone who has it. Now, I have not tested positive or anything like that. But of course, with that, that means that I need to do a self-quarantine for 14 days. Now, how do I quarantine if I have to have people take care of me? How do you do that? Well, that's why my attendants now have these full-fledged uh, suits on, and they will be wearing those for the next 14 days as they come in and care for me. So it has drastically uh, changed my life. I, I haven't gone anywhere, but I've done a whole lot of Zoom calls and Facebooks <laughs> and FaceTimes and all those kinds of things uh, in order to stay active and in order to uh, remain connected uh, while we have this period of disconnection. So that made me think of a, an interesting thought. Um, so you've done everything possible uh, that you need to do to, to not get the virus and you happen to come in contact with it, uh, be exposed to it. And the word that came to mind for me was compassion. So how do you, uh, in this moment, show yourself compassion and show the, the workers um, that work with you compassion? You know, and, 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 and that's a great question. For me, when, 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 I, when I was called this morning by the organization that provides my care and I was told that I had been exposed, of course, you have that first, you have that first jolt of, whoa, okay, what's happening with me? But instantly, my next thought was, is she okay? How is she? Um, and I even reached out to her. She hadn't answered yet, but I even reached out to her um, because that is simply a part of this is not anything that anyone did intentionally. Um, this is not something that, um, that was done maliciously or anything like that. In fact, she always wore her mask around me. So I know that those measures were taken in an attempt to protect me. 
And so I really believe that so many of the things that are going on are issues of compassion. Uh, even with the even with the social issues that are going on right now, those are issues of compassion. Um, and my thinking is, in terms of compassion for myself, you know, you run through the you run through the checklist of what did I do, and what, you know, what what could I have done differently? And of course, when you think back like that, you do think of things you could do differently. But the truth is, even doing those things differently would not necessarily have protected you uh, from 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 being exposed. Um, and so it really just, it, it's about understanding that this is a human condition, these, and that we're all human, uh, and that these are things that we have to deal with. And also, another part of the compassion is just remaining positive, knowing that there are things that, there are times where I just have to take a break from all the news and from all the clutter and all of the things that are vying for my attention, I have to take a break from that and just kind of breathe and just do things that are enlightening, do things that are uplifting and, and, and or just sit there and meditate or pray uh, just to recharge my batteries. Over the last couple of weeks, honestly, I've been feeling absolutely exhausted. Yeah. And I, I've had moments of, well, I just need to, to just chill. And so this weekend, I took the time to do absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And this week I feel so much better because of it. So, and I'll tell you, man, it's, it's, been, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. I lost my grandmother uh, to COVID-19 a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, you know, you, when, when it gets that close um, and you actually lose someone with it that close, it brings it into into focus. It brings it into focus that this thing is real. This thing is real, and we've got to do what we can to protect ourselves. Well, man, um, I know that's got to be rough going through that at this moment for sure. Um, just knowing you, I'm sure you <laughs> you're close to your your grandmother, and just knowing you as a human being, I imagine that to be the case. Um, yeah. And boy, let me tell you, I think from my perspective, uh, my mom and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, this is showing character of, of people that you may not have realized the character of uh, or the extent of um, in the, in this moment and I, I say that because uh my brother he'll come by the house and and help do some stuff for my mom and throughout this whole experience he's always walked in and worn a mask when wow. he may not otherwise right but it's he understands um not only what my mom is uh like her wishes but he also has an understanding of how it could impact me as well and so that's interesting to be able to see that happen in real time because uh, right. it's, it's stuff that we don't ever talk about it's right something that he understands and something like that's love right there that's love in action. Absolutely it is. Yeah. It's love in action because the idea behind it is I don't want to do anything to put you in jeopardy and I'm going to show you. I'm going to actively do that. I know you still need the care. I know you still need things done, but I'm going to do everything that I can do to protect you. And, um, and actually that's what this young lady did. You know, she wore her mask. She did those things. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things whereas it's 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 where we live now and honestly you know in south carolina we have seen the uptick of cases uh since the reopening yeah. uh, of the government and just let me be very frank and very upfront what we are experiencing is a failure of leadership there are so many lives that have been lost and so many people who are now ill because of the lack of leadership 
And if anybody ever, ever imagined, well, why do people focus so much on that kind of thing? This is why. This is why. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's something absolutely that all of this is teaching us. It's teaching me for sure um, that we are yearning for leadership. And uh, I think we're learning that it's going to come from unexpected places i mean Absolutely. honestly that's why i want to have conversations like this because right. i feel uh, a deep calling that this is a opportunity for me to display some sort of leadership in the platform that i have and i think right. we're seeing a lot of that happening in the world and it's just it's coming from uh, talking about labels, right? It's coming from people who may not wear the uh, label of leader as we see right. in a societal standard. Right. Um, and I get that. I fully get that, Nathan. And, 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 and let me say this, because just because you don't wear the title doesn't mean you don't have the mantle. Uh, yeah. And honestly, before you ever wear the title, if you really are that thing, you will act in that way well before someone has said, oh, yes, this person is that. And I will tell you that you have been operating as a leader in this space for a very long time now. This is not new. This is something that you have done consistently. And your consistency is the reason that you're a trusted voice. Your consistency and, and, and your openness and your empathy is the reason that people do indeed trust what you say. So I, I commend you, young man, uh, for, for the work that you're doing. I really do. And, and I think back on, I think back on when we first met and, and, and the development that has happened over the years. And it really is an amazing thing to see and watch. Yeah, we were, we were both, uh, we were both quite young back then, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm a little bit older, but you definitely, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate the acknowledgement there. And obviously I see you as someone that I look up to as a, as a leader. And I, I'm blessed that um, we're so close. And it's crazy to think that like one, one opportunity and one interaction can create a lot of difference for, uh, um, relationships right because we we didn't spend a lot of time together right but i think when you have a connection with people uh, it doesn't take a long time to um, see where someone's coming from and see their heart and and all of that so um i think you do do the same as well um i'm curious so switching gears a little bit i'm curious and i might not ask this question in the way that i want to but how do you think or no what do you think the virus is actually showing us as it pertains to what we're also dealing with in the social um justice stuff that's going on in the world right now? That's a great question. And I think the virus has revealed a number of different things um, about us. I think that, um, first of all, it has, uh, and let me kind of break this down into to some sections, okay? Um, it has shown the frailty of us all. It has shown us that there are many things that we deemed as necessary that are integral parts of our life that are not necessarily necessary anymore. I think that it has also opened up a common denominator in us all that we really all are human and we are fragile in so many ways that something is so minute and something that seems so small and only affects such a small number of people could then explode to something huge and really has an impact 
on every area of our lives. I think that it's also shown that there are a lot of organizations, companies, businesses in particular, that tout things like, yes, we want to uh, work with inclusion and we want to um, we want to make it a business imperative to include people with disabilities. We want to make it a business imperative. Why not? We want to make it, it is a business imperative. And it is a business imperative that we create environments where people are included and that we have a diverse workforce. But when this pandemic hit, the first things that they began to cut were those things that they previously called a business imperative. Those things that they previously called something that was important. And they said it was for the purpose of maintaining jobs and all those kinds of things. Now keep in mind, some of these companies had began to see record amounts of income coming in because things shifted. So what it exposed was that, that maybe it was not as much of a business imperative as it was speak, as it was just talk. So I think that the virus exposed some of that and it also offered opportunities for us to do some things to make a change. But I think the virus also highlighted some disparities that exist within our community, particularly things like uh, the digital divide that exists where you have uh, rural communities and, and minority communities that may not have access or as much access to a uh, high speed internet or access to laptops, tablets, and computers uh, that some other um, some other communities have because how many people have begun to work from home during this pandemic mm -hmm. so when you look at it it really explodes how wide the digital divide actually is and not even just in terms of employment but also in terms of education um, it exposed flaws in our educational system not just as it relates to access and, and uh, connectivity but it also showed gaps uh, particularly for students uh, who require special education classes. Um, the gaps that have been exposed in that are, are, are really pretty astonishing uh, when you look at it. So there are so many facets uh, that, um, that this virus uh, has exposed. And absolutely, um, the racial disparities, uh, particularly in the United States of America, when you look at the, um, the uh, infection rate or the mortality rate as a uh, as it really leads to COVID-19, particularly how that breakdown looks in terms of ethnicity uh, and socioeconomic status. Um, so those I believe are the major areas in which this virus has, has uncovered some things. And I think one of the really powerful things that has happened is that it made us all pause. It made everybody kind of wait a minute, take a break, chill for a second and really kind of look at some things. Um, so it's, um, it's really exposed a lot of what we covered up, a lot of what we ignored. And it's also revealed a lot of things that we had no clue existed. Yeah, and you said so many things there that, that I think are interesting. Uh, First and foremost, one of the things that I was thinking as you were talking about the virus itself, thinking about if you are somebody who's sitting there or listening to this, watching it, whatever, and you feel like your, your voice doesn't matter, your voice can be like the virus itself. Mm -hmm it can start small, it can start wavering, and it can explode. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, I would challenge you, if you want to use your voice for good, because it can be for good or for bad, right? You, you get to choose how you use your voice. But if you're feeling like your voice doesn't matter, I challenge you to show up and use it consistently, even, even if it's wavering at this moment in time, because you don't know uh, when that moment of explosion will happen uh, right. for you. 
Right. And the explosion starts with the spark. Very plain and simple. It starts with the spark. And your voice could be the spark that ignites something incredible. And it does not necessarily mean that it's all on you. It does not necessarily mean that you have all the answers or that even when you open your mouth that you've got it all together. But what it does mean is that you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. Speak. Use that voice. I, I, I have a podcast called 5P with Lamandre. And really the whole, the whole purpose of the podcast is to highlight people who are doing something to better the world. And when I mean doing something to better the world, they can start right there in their own little corner. Mm -hmm. But the whole purpose of it is to highlight people that are doing things to make the world a better place. And honestly, that's that spark. That is that, that one little spark that, it can, that can ignite an entire powder, powder keg. So I, I, I agree with you, Nathan. I'm glad you said that. And, and I've had conversations over the past months um, with friends who, um, because of their specific type of disability, they've, uh, it's been really hard for them to work in the past where they've had jobs, but nobody at their job really understood the impact that the work environment had on their particular disability um, and the the individual I'm speaking of has mast cell disease so it like chemical sensitivity things like that are are huge for that population and I think this has shown <laughs> that that conversation of well we can't afford for you to work from home has been totally like I'm just gonna say it the way that it, it makes me feel in this moment and it's that is bullshit yeah it, it was just a an excuse to not uh want to do extra paperwork in the moment and right. even the paperwork now is like oh yeah so this was much simpler than we actually uh made it out to be in the first place and uh, one of the greatest things that, that she said during this was, you may have been dealing with this for three months, four months, however long, but tried dealing with this for decades at a time. Right, right. And I think that that's another thing. You know, many of us in the disability community have been doing this kind of thing for a very long time. So you know, the, 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 the working from home or, or finding alternative ways to get things done, we were all had at that. This is something that we've done for a very long time. And honestly, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that, oh no, that's too much paperwork. We can't do that. Well, now you have to. Now you have to. And you realize that it goes back to that, that, that same old address that a lot of people don't realize or don't care about an issue until it affects them directly, mm -hmm. until, it's, until it's right at their doorstep. And then they care about it and oh, now they get the revelation. But the truth is it had been there all the time. Now granted, better late than never, but man, you gotta make up. You gotta make up because as you said, that was straight BS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I think, yeah, you, you touched on a lot of things like the the education system and specifically um, individuals who are receiving special education services. I can only imagine how challenging, like there's obviously a lot of adapting that's happening or not happening uh, right now. Uh, it should be happening, but that's right. not always the case. But I imagine there's a lot that's going on just trying to figure out how to make all that work right now. If I was a teacher, I remember going into those classrooms and being face to face with students and being like, okay, well, I know we got to adapt this. So how do we make it work? And to translate that into digital form will be interesting to figure out. And I don't know the answers. 
honestly, a lot of people are struggling. Um, a lot of educators are struggling, and 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 the young people um, are are really, really uh, getting a bum deal in terms of in terms of their education and what they're actually getting out of it. Um, you know, I'm always an advocate, always have been an advocate, and I just saw some things um, from people that I that I didn't even know, but it was on social media, and some of the things that have happened. Uh, and it, it, it's a travesty. It really is a travesty. And what's sad is that so often what ends up happening is literally they will say things like, well, we got to get our other students taken care of and then we'll come back to you. It's how do you tell somebody that about their child? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you as an educator and res being responsible for the education of all of our children, how do you say your child has to wait or these group of kids have to wait while we get this right over here. And, and we've literally seen that, we've seen that. And we've seen very, very, very poor um, performance in terms, of, in terms of what's being done uh, for students who may have a 504 or an IEP, um, uh, individualized education plan, um, what's being done for those individuals. Um, and, and, and I'm sure that there are people who are doing it well. There are districts that are doing it well, but I've also seen a lot that are not so good at it, you know. And just to add some, like, so you guys get a clear picture, I would have been one of those students that qualified for what Lamondre just spoke about. And just thinking from my own lens, if a teacher would have told me that, <laughs> I would not have handled that well um, right. because we make a lot of assumptions that you don't understand what's going on. And there's right. lo lots of kids that are being talked about uh, and not talked to. Yeah. So. And, and let me tell you, this, this thing is, is, it actually goes deeper than the teacher. This is, these are district officials saying that. So this thing is yeah. systemic. This is systemic, man. This is, um, you know, because it, it's one thing to deal one-on-one -on -one with an individual teacher, but then when those who are over mm -hmm. um, the system, when this is their attitude, when this is their retort, when this is what they say, that tells you that it is a systemic issue because they're the people who are actually making the system function. So this is systemic. So it goes way deeper. Um, than, than, than the frontline worker. In this case, the frontline worker is the teacher. But honestly, you know, when, when systemically, when the system says that, the teacher really doesn't have very much, uh, very much range. Yeah, and they're, <laughs> let's just say that they're, they're fearing for their own safety and security when they say, well, I don't believe that that's right. And right. at the end of the day, that's a very powerful thing to fight against, uh, no matter what it's about, because we all want to survive at the end of the day. Self-preservation is the law of the land. Yeah, you know, man. And, and when you speak against self-preservation, that's, that's, uh, that's tough. Yeah. Um, so touching on systemic stuff, I'm, I want to talk specifically about your experience being a black man with a disability in the world today and and what that looks like for you right well i tell you um uh, as you know times are changing and honestly you know the energy and the momentum that's out there now, that's new, that's new. But honestly, the issues that brought that energy about, it's been there all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am, I am thankful now that I see people who don't look like me that are now speaking up, that are now putting their bodies on the line, that are now raising their voices and actually actively involved in making a change. That is a welcomed, welcomed thing. But the truth is, this is what we've been screaming about 
for a very, very, very long time. I, I did an interview yesterday um, on another program called Human Potential at Work. And it was myself, a police officer, um, and, a, um, and a clinical psychologist, and, um, and the host of the show. And I told them a story about when I was a child. When I was a child, um, my neighbor that lived two stores down from me, his name was Tillman Milhouse Jr. He was one of South Carolina's first African-American state troopers. And when I saw Mr. Milhouse, he was absolutely the closest thing to Superman to me other than my grandfather. And I had, have and still have such an admiration and respect for him. And he was really my first introduction to law enforcement. So I, 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 I grew up with, a, with a, a healthy respect, but as I got older and I started with the interactions and seeing how we were treated, my feelings towards law enforcement began to shift. Not that, I, not that I'm against law enforcement or anything like that, but I've been in situations where we were stopped for no reason at all. They couldn't say that we did anything wrong. They were questioning us, where are you going? What's going on? Da, 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 da. And there was nothing wrong. There was no issues. There was nothing wrong whatsoever. Even at the expense of saying, hey, we've gotten to the point where we're going to be late. Well, you're going to sit here and talk to me for a minute. Why? Why? And the thing is, when I talked to other people who didn't look like me, they didn't have those experiences. Those things were not their experiences. And so right now, you know, as we were all outraged when we saw what happened with Ahmaud Arbery, we were all outraged when we saw what happened with George Floyd. We were all outraged when we saw what happened with Breonna Taylor and, and, and the list goes on and on and on. This time, this time, there's a difference. And you know, when I do diversity and, and inclusion sessions, one of the things that I always say is find a champion and be a champion. And what I mean by find a champion and be a champion is that find people who are not directly impacted by the issues that you're dealing with and ally with those people. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes they can get you entry into rooms and seats at tables that you otherwise would not have it. Even if they can't get you a seat at the table, they can be your voice at that table, which would then give you entryway. But the flip side of that is also to be a champion for someone. Be a champion for someone who you are not necessarily directly impacted by the same issue. Because you need to still offer that same voice. You need to use the privilege that you have to make a difference for that one. Because I really believe, and I still believe this to the core of my being, that if any one of us is left behind, then we all are behind. If any one of us is discriminated against, then all of us can face injustice and discrimination. So how am I right now as a black man with a disability? I'm angry, I'm hurt, I'm tired, but I'm hopeful, I'm resilient, I'm strong, and I have more faith now than ever before that we are going to change this. We simply have to, we simply have to. What do you think is the most, looking from that lens specifically of the two labels of black man and disabled what do you think is the most important thing that is not talked about in conversations i, I think one of the most important things that is not talked about in conversations is the fact that we're human that that, that we are that it, it, it's so funny because when we start to when we start to talk about those things that people highlight, you know, race and ability, they kind of compartmentalize them and act as if, oh, that's just the one thing. 
oh, 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 he has spinal muscular atrophy. So then that becomes the defining point of what I am and who I am and the sum total of who I am. Or, or he's a black guy. So then that becomes the defining point of who I am when the truth is all of those things are secondary to the fact that I am human. And that I have the same desires, the same wants, the same needs that everyone else does. And so we look at the divisions as opposed to what is common. And here's the thing, my disability is a defining point, but it is not the defining point. The fact that I'm black is a defining point, but it is not the defining point. The defining point is that I'm human. That is the real defining point with all the complexities, with all of the changes, with all of the differences that that brings to the table. The first thing is that I'm human. And that my value, the value that I bring is equal to the value that anybody else brings. Pick them, name them, I'm there. And so what happens is we tend to bleed the humanity out of the difference. Mm. And that is something that I think we miss in this. I think that one of the things that was so, so heartbreaking about the video with George Floyd was the fact that he cried out for his deceased mother. And even though I'm not a parent, even though I'm certainly not a mother. Um, well, some have said that, but you know, that's, that's a different story. That's, that's a different line. But I think the thing that was so pointed about that was that mothers all over heard that cry. And that humanized them because they thought of their child calling out for them and there was nothing that they could do. And even as a man watching that video, and hearing him say, I can't breathe and everything hurts. Again, it, 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 it screamed out for compassion. It screamed out for somebody to help him. The bystanders, the people that were standing by saying, hey, get off that man. He's not moving. It called out to them as well. And what it really called to was, he's human. I don't care, I don't care what you may have thought he did before. I don't care what your reasoning was. All of that stuff is now null and void. You got him, you got him. So what it says to me is that humanity is crying out. Humanity is yearning. Humanity is reaching for us to come back to that and embrace that. And I, I will tell you, it, it's, it has been encouraging to see people from all walks of life really begin to speak up and actively want to do something different. Yeah, we may have different ways of, of looking at it. We may have different ways of, of trying to get to the same result. But the truth is, it is encouraging to see that. So I think the biggest thing that we're missing or that we have missed is that humanity must stand. You won't get any debate from me there. Um, that's... I mean, that's the label that we all wear all the time is our humanity. Um, man, <laughs> thanks thanks for, for sharing that. And yeah, I, I think you hit it on the head, right? Where <laughs> the, mo the moment stuff like that happens, it made it not about all the compartmentalized labels and you or me or anybody watching could relate to themselves in that moment with things that he said um 
Cause yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably be screaming out for, for my mom or a family member. Um, because they provided that safety, they provided love, they provided security. And in that moment that wasn't happening. Right. Um, right. And it also made me think about all the times when I've had conversations um, out in public where um, <laughs> I remember actually going to an April conference one time and uh, this was early on when I was uh, just starting and we were in Alaska and I had just met all these uh, all the young people, right? All the people in their their twenties, and we were doing what young people in twenties do. We found a place to go, hang out, and uh, talk and party a little bit, type of deal. And uh, but I remember one conversation with one guy who was just, just happened to be at the hotel we were at. And I remember him talking to um, a girl that happened to be an attendant for um, one of the other girls there. And he, he said to the girl, why do you hang out with those people? Or it's nice that you hang out with those people. And boy, I, t I tell you what, you, wanna, you want to see humanity? Talk to somebody like they're not human. Like that that stuff pissed me off. I'm like, you're, you're no better than me. I, yeah. I will stand there and fight you if you think <laughs> you're gonna call me like that. <laughs> Obviously you can tell right now, like to be called you people. Right. And to that strips away humanity absolutely uh so yeah dude i get that um what do you think uh right now is is a step that we can take to start to practice um consciously using our humanity you know, I think that one of the major things is that it, it, it really starts with the understanding, first of all. Um, I think that, we, first of all, I love your entire, you know, no, no label defines me. I absolutely love that. And I think that what has happened is that people have gotten so used to being categorized and labeled that not only have we bled, bled any humanity out of it, but the other thing that we've done is that we've made people monolithic. We made people you 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 are this one thing and that's it. But there is there is intersectionality that we really have to begin to understand. Because here's the thing: yes, I'm a black man. Yes, I'm a black man with a disability. I'm a black man with a disability from the south. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a black man with a disability from the south who's incredibly sexy. So with all of those things, these are part of who I am. This is a part of what I am. But, but in all seriousness, I think that we really have to begin to understand that we are complex. We are very complex. And as individuals, there are so many things that make me who I am. And all of those things will make me a different me tomorrow than I am today. So not only am I complex, I'm in ever evolving ball of complexity and so are we all and the day that we stop evolving and changing is the day that we need to die so i think that one of the first steps that we can do to really begin to move this ball forward is to understand that we are complex is to understand that there is no one who is just one thing. That all of our experiences, all of our background, all of the things, all of the things that we are make us who we will be. 
And I think it's important that we begin to understand that. And when I say we begin to understand that, not just about you, but I need to understand that about myself. Yeah. I need to have a real authentic evaluation of who I am and what I am. And then the other piece of that, we need to get to know each other, man. We need to get to know each other. We need to get to know each other. And we have to recognize that we're not perfect, that we're going to mess this up. <laughs> we're going to mess it up. We're going to mess it up. We're going to get it right. We're going to mess it up. Um, and so I guess uh, with the recognition that we're going to make mistakes, but that really is about is about practicing some patience with ourselves and with others and try to find the moments where we can be taught and where we can teach. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And man, with that, that requires openness. Absolutely. Uh, and I think when, when you're a monolith or you speak from that being an identity, there's so much closed to uh, possibility when you only can see the boxes around one label and you're living within that box because like a plant, like a shark, whatever it is, you're going to grow to the level of your box. Right. So my question to the audience listening and watching is what size box are you living in? And how is that opening up the opportunity for you to grow? Man, this has been a, a powerful, powerful conversation. Um, what's if you were going to lead, uh, leave the audience with one thing, or maybe there's something I haven't touched on that you want to touch on, what would that be? You know, man, I, I am, my view is really simple uh, in this, even though I know I've just talked about how complex and all of that kind of thing, but it really boils down to something simple. And I, I am forever optimistic. I, I am, you know, it, it's, we're going to get through this. Um, things will change for the better. But sometimes in order to get to the better, you've got to go through the worst. And I believe that what we're seeing is the worst bubbling to the surface in order for us to get to the better. The thing that I, I would want to leave, um, leave you with is this, is that the best is in you. The best is in you. And it is our job, it is our duty, it is our requirement that we present the best. Now that does not mean perfection. Because as I said before, the world does not need your perfection. What the world needs is your presence. So be present. Speak up when you need to speak up. Be there when you need to be there. When you see your brothers and sisters struggling, offer the hand that you can offer to help. When you see injustice, when you see people being wronged, when you see things that are simply not right, do not be silent in that. Now, that doesn't mean you go jump up in somebody's face every time, but what it does mean is that you allow your voice to be heard. Because the truth is, if enough of us do that, that injustice has to stop. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Be safe. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And live big live full and live authentic. Man, Lamandre, thanks so much for, for jumping on. I know that you guys listening and watching got value out of this conversation. 
And the goal of these conversations, all conversations, no matter what they come from, from the platform of No Labels Defines Me, is to open up opportunity to see a different perspective. So at the time when you are making a decision about something in your life, you remember and you are closely connected to somebody that something impacts. And so with that said, remember to be patient, be diligent, never, never quit, and that you must uh, lead, love, and listen. Lead yourself, lead others, love yourself, and love others, and listen to yourself, and listen to others. I hope you enjoyed this episode of No Label Live. If you did, share it with a friend and tag me. Let me know your thoughts about the episode. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at The Loneliness Coach. You can also become a member of the No Label Fam by joining our Facebook community. Let a friend know that they are more than a label. They matter and they are one step away from their success. Remember, my friends, be patient, be diligent, and never quit.